Boldwood presents A Second-Hand Husband, written by Claire Kalman and read by Tilly Vosborough. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One The Auction So, I'm lying in the bath, wondering exactly when my knees became so weird and knobbly, when my mobile rings. It's my husband, Carl. Husband? Still seems so unlikely. I never thought I'd meet anyone I could stand to spend more than a fortnight with on holiday, never mind a lifetime. We've been married for 27 days. Hello, darling. I never called anyone darling before. He's probably calling to remind me how much he loves me. I never had anyone call me every day just to do that either. Sometimes... I have this feeling lurking at the back of my mind that maybe I'm simply imagining the whole thing. That there is no Carl, that it's not possible to be this happy and it actually be real. It's as if I'm waiting for something awful to happen and unravel it all. Hey, you. His voice sounds soft and sexy. Usually, Carl's almost allergic to lowering his voice. When we're out for dinner, I have to beg him to shush because people keep turning around to stare. Maybe he's speaking quietly because he wants to say something seductive. I'm in the bath. I make my voice low and breathy to match his. Are you sick? You sound awful. No, I'm fine. It must be a bad signal. So much for sounding sexy. Listen, Nat. I've found the house. Exactly like we talked about. Our dream house. Now he's speaking at a gallop. Loads of charm, beams, big fireplace, huge garden, plus extra land. Hidden down a private lane, and there's a barn. God, you'll love me for this. It even has a whacking great duck pond. A pond? I sit up quickly, sloshing water over the side of the bath. Carl says I'm a dreamer, but even I never thought we'd find somewhere with a proper pond. He laughed when I put it in the must-have column. That's incredible. When did you see it? We hadn't even started house hunting officially yet, but Carl popped down to Kent for a day or two to visit his children. We're supposed to start looking next weekend. Carl's just sold his amazing penthouse flat so that we'll be ready to pounce, as he puts it. Where is it? I, I can't wait to see it. Why don't you make an appointment for- We can't, Natalie. It's up for auction. If we want it, we have to go for it. He sounds not impatient exactly, but a bit frazzled the way he does if I call him at the office and he's about to go into a meeting. Well, when's the auction? I reach for my towel. I, I could... Now, it's starting. I, I have to go. But Carl, it's beautiful, darling. Will be beautiful. You'll love it. I absolutely promise you. But surely I could... Hang on a sec. I need to... I strain to hear. He can't actually be bidding, can he? Not when I haven't even seen it. Carl? The setting's perfect, and the location. I have to go. So it's good for your kids? Yes, really handy. Natalie, my love, do you trust me? I feel myself melt. I love it when he calls me that. Of course I trust him. I trust Carl with my life. You know I do. Well then, my darling, just say yes. I pause for a moment. Carl's always saying I need to trust my instincts more, like he does. I need to take more risks, be more decisive, throw myself into life boldly instead of being so cautious. I take a breath. Nat? Yes? Love you. Talk later. Just tell me where it is, I shout, but it's too late. He's gone. Barely ten minutes later, my mobile beeps and it's a message from Carl. It's ours. Just doing paperwork. Call you later. Love you. H. Kiss. H for husband. I didn't dream it then. We have a house. My husband has just bought a house. Our house. Without me. On the one hand, I'm excited. I really am. I feel like a kid the night before Christmas, wondering what will be in my stocking when I wake up. Our dream house. We'll be able to make it exactly how we want it. We've both looked forward to this so much. 
Sometimes we lie together in the dark talking about it. How we'd have lazy days pottering about the garden, taking time to relax and be together. Carl works so hard. He never stops. But once we move, he's planning to work from home as much as he can. I'm sure he'll grow vegetables and take up fishing or rambling or woodwork. Find something that will unglue him from his phone and his laptop. Anything that will let him shrug off all that stress and simply be for a while. Of course, he's much too young to retire. He's only 41. And we can't support both of us on what I make. But the idea is for him to cut back his hours. Learn to live life at a slower pace. See more of his children. If he carries on at the rate he's working now, he'll burn himself out. Last year, one of his clients had a fatal heart attack and he was only a few years older than Carl. Maybe Carl will even change career completely. Build tree houses or weave willow baskets or wattle fences. Anything that's a world away from PR. We're going to be so happy. And it'll be much cheaper to live down in Kent anyway. You get way more for your money than in London. Carl got a really good price for his apartment, so we don't even need to sell my tiny place too. Carl says we should rent it out for extra income, but I think he should use it when he needs to stay up in London for work. On the other hand, I feel strangely flat. We have a house. We have a house. I splash the bathwater with the palms of my hands and say it out loud, but it just feels silly. I wonder why Carl didn't call me straight away afterwards instead of sending a text. Of course, he'll be bound up in all the paperwork. There must be lots to sort out. Still, is it really so much faster to tap in a text and to phone for a minute? So we could, well, share the moment? The bath's practically cold now. I get out and grab my towel and shove the thought away. I will focus on thinking about our new house. Our new home. I tried to gather up the few tiny fragments Carl threw my way when he called. Beams, he said. It's old then. Ancient and lovely, with thick walls of weathered stone. Or, more likely, brick, as it's in Kent. Mellow, warm brick that glows in the late spring sunshine. Down a narrow lane. I picture it in the perfect spot. A hidden dip, as if nestled in a gentle giant hand. Maybe there are roses framing the front door, and honeysuckle scrambling up to our bedroom window so we can breathe in its heady scent as we get ready for bed. I close my eyes trying to picture it. I'm sure it's absolutely beautiful. I open my eyes suddenly remembering. Will be beautiful. Carl said it was beautiful and then amended it to will be beautiful. I remember now. Odd. Carl's a wonderful man, but I wouldn't say he's an absolute stickler for the truth. He's not a liar or anything, but he's in PR, and sometimes he has this slight tendency to... to varnish the truth a tiny bit. To polish it up, to make it more palatable. I mean, I can see how he needs to be able to do that for work. It's just sometimes it tips over into other areas of life. I suppose it becomes a habit he finds hard to break. When we first got together... Only six months ago. It was a thing I found hardest to adjust to. People say I'm very frank. <laughs> they don't necessarily mean it as a compliment. My big sister Celeste is always telling me I need to learn when to be direct and honest and when to dial it down a tad, but I don't see why. Where's the benefit in lying? The truth always bubbles up to the surface in the end, doesn't it? So, will be beautiful. Hmm. My guess is it's probably because it needs redecorating, which is fine. We never expected to find something ready to move into. Either the decor is old and tired, or it's not to our taste, or it needs more than redecorating. A vision jumps into my mind of a picturesque ruin, a low assemblage of loose stones with a wooden door half off its hinges, swinging wildly in the wind. Keep calm. Don't overreact. The house probably needs updating, maybe rewiring, a new kitchen and bathroom, that sort of thing. That's not so bad. In fact, it's good because we can make it the way we want instead of having to live with someone else's fancy gold taps and hideous tiles simply because they're nearly new. Yes, once we put our own stamp on it, it'll be perfect. I can pick up bargains when I'm at antique auctions. 
gorgeous old rugs, a long oak table worn smooth by a thousand elbows over the generations. I picture a crackling fire in a huge ingle nook fireplace flanked by squashy sofas. I add in a golden retriever, sprawled in front of the hearth as a finishing touch. I go through to my bedroom to get dressed, then plunk myself down on the bed, averting my gaze from the twelve test patches of different paint colours on the wall above the headboard. They'd been there for nearly two years. Yes, yes, I will pick one. Eventually. Maybe Carl could choose the colour instead. I'm terrible at making decisions. When we go out for supper, I sometimes secretly look the menu up online before we go, so that I can have extra time to think about what to order. Otherwise, Carl gets this sort of look. I can see him gripping his wine glass. I know he's trying so hard to be patient, to not say, please, please, just order something, anything. Even I get annoyed with myself in restaurants. Surely the house isn't actually derelict. The image of a ruin leaps back into my mind, this time with wild goats springing nimbly through the empty window holes. No, no, we said no ruins, we agreed. We talked about it a thousand times and we decided, no total renovation jobs. We're not exactly the king and queen of DIY. I can paint a room reasonably well, make curtains, put up bookshelves and I've sanded a couple of floors, but... Carl doesn't understand why you'd want to do that sort of thing yourself when you could pay someone else to do it while you're off doing something more interesting. I once took a photo of him on my phone as he was changing a light bulb, because it was such a freak occurrence. Before he met me, he used to ask his cleaner to do it. I flip open my big road map, which I keep by the bed now. Carl laughs at me, because no one uses paper maps anymore but I only like the Maps app on my phone when I want directions from A to B. It's no good when you want an overview, is it? Even though we hadn't started house hunting properly yet, well, not together anyway, we know the area we want. Carl has marked the strike zone on the map, a 30-mile radius around Little Wyford, the village where his two children, Saskia and Max, live with their mum. There are plenty of villages to choose from, a couple of small towns that he says are lovely too. Or the house might be completely rural, given that Carl mentioned it was down a lane. Wherever it is, I really hope it's near his kids. At the moment, the journey takes Carl over two hours from North London. He tries to go most weekends, if the kids have space to see him in their scarily busy schedules, tennis lessons and riding and piano practice and so on. Usually he takes him out for lunch or to the beach if it's nice weather or to a film, and then he drives all the way back to London the same day and spends the evening slumped on the sofa looking like a spaniel's lost his bone. It'll be so much easier now. He said it was, didn't he? Really handy. Well, that's great. If it's only ten or fifteen miles away, he could pop over any time. It might even be a bit closer than that, I suppose. Five miles. Or less. Which would be fantastic, obviously. He might have said how far away it was. I mean, really handy, could be twenty miles. Compared with this journey now, that's relatively round the corner. Or it could be ten miles, or... Or... It could be... It could be literally round the corner. Suddenly my throat feels scratchy and parched. My skin clammy and cold. As if I'm about to address an audience of two hundred people on a subject about which I know absolutely nothing. I look back down at the map, at the circle of possibilities pencilled on the page. Don't jump to conclusions, it'll be fine. There's a 30-mile radius around the village. That's a circle with a 60-mile diameter, so it's a huge area. I remember it's something to do with pi. Maybe pi times two to the power of x equals r. No, that's not it. Pi times r plus two equals question mark? There's definitely an R. R for radius. Hmm. R times pi to the power of two? No. Two pi R. Yes, it's two pi R. I can't believe I remember that after all this time. Sitting in maths, secretly drawing silly pictures of the teachers under the desk with my best friend Harriet, while Miss Hill stood at the front, drawing a perfect circle on the blackboard freehand. 
amazing what your brain can absorb when you're not even paying attention properly. So, multiply the radius by pi, call it 3.14 times 2, and that gives you the, the... I think that was a point when I got sent out of class for talking. It must be the area. So that's 3.14 times 30 for the radius, which is 90-something, rounded up to 100, then times 2, so it's 200. 200 miles. It could be anywhere within a 200-mile zone, say, which is absolutely fast. I try Carl and his mobile, but it cuts straight to voicemail. I tell him I'm longing to know more about the house and to please call me back as soon as he can. Then I text him, too. Great news about house. Where is it? Love you, wife, kiss. Now I've remembered. It's not two pi r at all. That, that's a circumference, which is no use at all, is it? It's pi r squared for the area. Why did Carl draw a stupid circle anyway? It would have been so much simpler if he'd drawn a square. I'm dashing out the door, realising that I'm in danger of being late to open up my shop yet again, when my phone beeps. It's a message from Carl responding to mine. V near Vil. Kiss. What? Which Vil? Village. A village or the village? And how near is V near, for that matter? I have a bad feeling about this. Remain calm. It's probably an entirely different village. But then why not say which one? He was in a rush. Press for time. That's all it is. God, it's the same village. I know it is. Okay, don't panic. I can live with that. He said V near Ville, so that means it's not in the village, right? At least there's a proper gap. It's not the same street or anything. We're not going to be popping in and out of each other's houses the whole time, are we? It'll be fine. Carl's always telling me I should try to be more positive, not always imagining every tiny little thing that could possibly go wrong. What he really means, I think, is that I should try to be more like him. Chapter Two The Marriage Expert It's nearly lunchtime. Well, actually, it's not even half past eleven yet, but I'm really hungry. So to me, it's nearly lunchtime. I'm teetering in the window of my shop, trying not to fall over while I lean right into the front to position a pretty rose ceramic jug on top of a Victorian washstand there. All morning I've been trying not to keep checking my phone as if I'm fifteen again, waiting for some boy I fancy to call me. I have a small shop in Islington, specialising in antique clocks. Rather ironic, given my tendency to be late. The shop's called Second Hand, which... Now sounds corny and unsubtle, but it seemed quite funny when I first thought of it. Anyway, obviously I'm not hefting huge grandfather clocks about in the window. I once tried to shift one I bought at an auction into my van and pulled a muscle in my back. Yes, clearly a very short woman cannot lift a long case clock single-handed into a van. I know that now. As well as the clocks, I sell small decorative objects, pairs of candlesticks, Stylish 1930s teapots, vases, marquetry boxes, that sort of thing. The kind of thing that catches someone's eye when they're looking in the window. My mobile rings. And I practically fall over this annoying Edwardian footstool I've put in the window in the hope that someone will fall in love with it and buy it so that I don't keep tripping over it. I grab my phone and answer it before I've even seen who it is because I'm so desperate to speak to Carl. But it isn't him. It's my older sister, Celeste. I love my sister to bits, of course, I really do, but she can be quite scary. I'm not entirely sure that she'll think letting Carl buy our house without me is a good idea. Luckily, after 36 years of being her sister, I know exactly how to handle her. Hi, I say, my voice bright. How goes it? I'm trying to sound light and breezy, la la la. How's work? Work's a heap of steaming shit. Why are you sounding so creepy and cheerful? Celeste's been a bit prickly the last couple of months, due to her impending 40th birthday this summer. She's taking it personally, as if God, Mother Nature and the universe have somehow conspired to bring her to this unfortunate point. 
I'm not. I mean, I'm happy. Of course I am. That's not creepy. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Newlywed bliss, I know, I know. You're supposed to be happy. It's sweet. The tone suggests otherwise, as if there's something decidedly suspect about this type of behaviour. There's a pause. Then I hear her inhale. Celeste has finally quit smoking after twenty years, but she's taken up vaping instead. Now when she inhales, she sounds like Darth Vader when an underling has failed to carry out an order to have someone killed. So why is work so bad at the mo- I start, but she cuts me off. Usual crap. Not worth your pretending to listen. Well, that's not fair. I do listen. Sorry, Noodle. I know you do. That's her pet family name for me when she's not being scary. Tell me something nice. Have you fixed up any viewings? Actually, I've got some really good news. Shit, you're pregnant. And I get to be the maiden aunt. Terrific. I'm not pregnant, honestly not. It's only... Well, we've bought a house. So fast? How come? Isn't it great? I prompt. I thought you hadn't even started looking seriously yet. According to Breakfast News, the great house quest doesn't kick off until next weekend. I've been going on about the dream house for so long, she knows as much about it as I do. Mm, but, but, but this was really special, so we had to grab it while we could. And it saved us having to trudge around hundreds of hopeless places. And But you've been looking forward to all that. I always thought you preferred the idea of looking for the perfect house more than the prospect of finding it. You know what you like. You love nosing round other people's places and thinking how much better it would be if you'd designed the decor. She knows me too well. I've been trying not to think about that. You know, Nats, you haven't actually bought it yet. You've got the search, survey, all that to do, yeah? You should carry on looking in case it falls through. It won't fall through. Seriously? Remember with my first flat? when No, really, we bought it. At auction. It's definitely ours. At auction. I can hear the note of disbelief creeping into her voice. When did you see this place? Ah, oh, I... Carl, we kind of bought it on impulse. The word hangs in the air for a few moments. I wish I could suck it back in. It's too late. She's picked up the scent like a cheetah sniffing a sickly gazelle. On impulse. This from the woman who stands dithering in the supermarket for half an hour because she can't decide whether to buy medium eggs or large. Uh-uh. I don't think so. That was only that one time, I protest. It's our dream house, I add defiantly. And it sounds a little feeble, even to me. Celeste sighs. She doesn't really go in for dreams. That's lovely, she says, in the tone she'd use to talk to a puppy or a toddler. But you have to be practical. I hope Carl didn't talk you into this. No, no, he... We, it sounds so, uh, I'm sure it'll be perfect. Natalie. Her voice has dropped about an octave. She knows. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, there's a customer, I uh, better go. You haven't seen the house yet, have you? Hang on, uh, I have to deal with the customer. Uh, yes, it is Edwardian. It's a really charming little piece, isn't it? You're fooling no one. You're the most useless liar on the planet. And since when have you talked to your customers as if you're auditioning for the Antiques Roadshow? Have you seen this house or not? I don't need to see it. Carl and I always love the same... Has your husband really bought a house, your first proper home together, without even letting you see it first? It's different when you're married, I blurt. You have to trust each other and... And do things together and decide things together. You're in it together. I believe that's the whole point, isn't it? What do you know? Who made you the marriage expert all of a sudden? There's a silence. A deep, scary silence. Celeste is divorced. She describes herself as being amicably divorced because she wants to make it clear to everyone that she's extremely grown up and civilised about the whole thing. But actually... She means amicably as in still sleeping together sometimes when they're both feeling lonely and or drunk. I can't even begin to understand how she can stand to be in the same room as that man, never mind the same bed. Um, Celeste. What? 
I'm really sorry. That came out all wrong. Whatever. No, I didn't mean, you know, listen, Natalie. Now I know she's really pissed off. Usually she calls me Nats. I wouldn't trust a man to choose a glass of wine for me, let alone a house, so maybe you're right. It's terrific that you can sit back and let someone else run your life for you. It's not what would work for me, but hey, as you say, I'm not exactly an expert on marriage, am I? The shop phone starts ringing. It's probably Carl, having failed to get me on my mobile, and I so want to talk to him, but I can't leave Celeste now. But you'll find someone perfect soon. The right man for you is out there, I, I know he is. They're not all like Jake. Jake, Celeste's ex-husband, had sex with the wife of Celeste's boss. For some reason, he decided a good time to do this would be during his own wedding reception. For some other reason, he decided a good time to confess to Celeste would be during their honeymoon. And then, when she returned home a week early, her boss fired her because he decided it was Celeste's fault for introducing them in the first place. Jake's a class act. Once upon a time, there was a stressed out old bitch who lived in an enchanted apartment. <laughs> Since when did you imagine I started believing in fairy tales? But I found someone lovely, and you're a much, much better catch than I am. You're so gorgeous and glam and successful, and your hair's not mad and frizzy like mine. Any man should jump at the chance to have you. The ones that jump at the chance nowadays are repellent all droopy and drippy, with soft, clammy hands and manicured nails. Hideous. The ones I like can't hack it with a woman who knows what she wants. They want some dim trophy wife with no hips and a permanent giggle. Celeste sighs. The other call goes to voicemail. Don't feel sorry for me, Nats, or I'll shoot you. I'm absolutely fine. In fact, I'm seeing someone at the moment. That's fantastic. Who is he? What's he like? I keep your pants on. He's just a bloke. He's not exactly intellect of the year, but he fucks like a god. It's what I need right now, okay? Okay. So how long have... There's no future in it, so please don't ask me any of that. Are you in love? Are you moving in together crap? It is what it is. We're not sailing off into the sunset or any of that bollocks. But still, if you're end of subject, and don't tell mum. I don't want another lecture about being true to my inner self, or my inner self will clonk her over the head with my briefcase. No, of course not. She sighs again. So what's this perfect house like, then? I hear her clickety-click click her vape again and inhale deeply. Please don't tell me it has a thatched roof, or I might have to vomit. More to the point, where is it? Um, it's sort of quite nearish to... to... Little Wyford, you know the village where Carl's kids live? So that's really, really good. He'll get to see them much more. How near? Well, you know, nearish. What? Twenty miles? Ten? What? I'm not a hundred percent sure of all the details right now, I say, as if she's asking me about the design of the wallpaper in the third bedroom. I clear my throat. Anyhow. It'll be much more convenient for everyone. You're such a hopeless liar, Nat. So what you're saying, not saying, is that you will be living on the doorstep of your husband's ex-wife. Oh, that sounds like a top plan. I told you this move was a stupid idea. What on earth were you thinking of? Why do you always have to exaggerate? It'll be so much better for Carl this way, being close to his children. I mean, naturally, his wife... The ex-wife lives there too, but she's remarried, remember? She's not still hankering after... I'm not saying she is. It's only that your new life together with Carl... It sounds quite a lot to take on. A house you haven't even seen, round the corner from his ex-wife, who you've never seen either, and his sprogs. That's a big deal. It could be quite fraught. They have a very civilised relationship. Carl gets on really well with her. That's why they got divorced, is it? Things are much better now. There's a pause. Good. I'm sure it'll be fine. I have the feeling Celeste was going to say something else. Something entirely different. It will be, I say. Moving near his kids will make Carl so happy. He's not like Dad was, you know. No one's saying he is, Noodle. 
Well, you do see that I have to think of what's best for him. Yeah, of course. Trust you to do the right thing. He's bloody lucky to have you. I hear her exhale sharply. I just hope he's thinking of what's best for you. Chapter 3. Conveniently Located Okay, confession time. It was my idea for us to move nearer to Carl's children in the first place. Since we've been together, I've always encouraged him to see them as much as possible, to have precious time alone, just the three of them, and I've never tried to muscle in on that. I would hate it if they ever resented me for taking their dad away from them. My own parents split up when I was seven, and we never saw much of my dad. At first he came every weekend to take me swimming, then he'd come back to the flat for a meal, but after a while his visits became less frequent, and then in the end he just showed up at our flat sporadically, bearing piles of presents and gigantic bars of chocolate. The rest of the time, money was pretty tight at home, so being showered with gifts and treats felt like Father Christmas had suddenly blown in. Dad was loud and funny and laughed a lot, only he had very dark hair rather than a white beard, and a cool black leather jacket rather than a red fur-trimmed costume. I'm not sure our mum enjoys his visits as much as we did. She'd smile and laugh, but looking back now, I think maybe it was hard for her to have him swan in, spoiling us with loads of gifts, then slope off into the night not to be seen again for months. Once, he gave us a pair of old-fashioned toy telephones that actually worked, but only if you were in the next room. They were cream with gold dials, very fancy looking, but they broke within a week, and I remember crying when they wouldn't work anymore. Mum gave me a cuddle and said we could still use them, only it would be let's pretend rather than like a real call. Then I overheard her talking to a friend about it and saying the toy phone summed up Martin to a T, all show and no substance. But it's fine. I'm completely calm. I know Celeste thinks moving down there is a crazy plan, but all I want is to make Carl happy. It was tearing him up every time he went down to Kent to see his children. He'd come back and throw himself on the sofa, then go into a sort of trance, gazing intensely at his mobile like a teenager, scrolling and swiping, or playing endless games without looking up. And when I'd ask him how it was, he'd say, Yep, fine, thanks, it was fine. As if we'd only just met. Then one time, he came back and he looked so crumpled. You have to see Carl to realise how uncrumpled he usually is. He's tall and rather striking, with thick dark hair and gorgeous blue-grey eyes. And he always looks smart, even in jeans. I didn't say anything. I looped my arms around him and snuggled my face into his chest. And he rested his chin on the top of my head. He really is a lot taller than me. <laughs> but then most people are. Then I ran him a deep bath. Getting into water is what I always do when I want to feel better about something. And I said, look, as we're planning to live together anyway, why don't we move nearer your kids? I mean, really near, so you can see them any time you want. I could have a shop anywhere. It doesn't have to be in London, and I'm sure you could work partly from home. He looked at me and for a minute he couldn't speak. He'd got undressed to get into the bath so he was naked and sexy, but also suddenly looked so sweet and vulnerable at the same time. He pulled me close and kissed me, and said, Really? Are you sure, my love? Positive, I nodded. I know how much this matters. You're amazing. Absolutely amazing. We'll find our dream house and I'll have a blue plaque put up. Residents of Natalie Glass, officially the most amazing woman in the world. No arguments. You're very silly. And I love you. I love you more. Carl is quite competitive. Did I mention that? And then we had sex on the bathroom floor which was incredible, until we rolled over and I banged my knee hard on the heated towel rail. Afterwards, he asked me to marry him. But I think he really wanted to propose. It wasn't just because he felt bad about my knee. It's only in the evenings, after work, that I get to see Carl. 
We were both living in his enormous swanky flat until it was sold, but now we're squashed into my tiny unswanky flat until we move. I hear his key in the door and I run to him. He takes me in his arms. You, he kisses me, are, kiss, one, kiss, incredible, kiss, woman. Oh, go on. I am not, I squirm. Carl has the gift of making absolutely anybody feel as if they're really special. It's true, he kisses me again, then picks me up easily, carries me through to the kitchen, as if I weigh no more than a bag of shopping. How many other women would not only tolerate moving near their husband's ex-wife and children, but actually come up with the idea in the first place? Yes, but when I said near, what I now realise I actually meant was, not very near at all. I feel like a fraud. I don't want to be incredible. I want to be selfish. I want to drum my heels on the floor like a spoilt brat and say, I don't like this stupid game anymore. What was I thinking of? Well, the kids need their dad and you need them. I do believe that. And in my head, I know it's right. It's just, I didn't know that I was going to feel like this inside. All mean and pinched and horrible. I thought I was capable of being considerate and decent. I didn't realise I'd need a new personality as well as a new home. He nods, his mouth tight. And the look in his eyes makes me want to cry. His silence says more than any words could. I know this means the world to him. I will make this work. I take his jacket and go to the kitchen to make him some coffee. So, tell me... Where is the house exactly? I say brightly. I'm fine with this. I practice telling people in my head as I fill the kettle. Yes, we're moving to the same area as my husband's children and his first wife. Yes, it's tremendously civilised. We all get along famously, tra-la-la. Your text said it's very near a village. You meant little Wyford, did you? Yes, of course. It's a fantastic position, down a private track. It's so secluded, yet it's less than a mile to the village. Less than a mile. I clunked the mugs down on the worktop harder than I meant to. This was my idea, I remind myself. It was all my idea. It'll be so handy for seeing the children, I say, struggling to keep my voice bright. Yes, as we're on the same side, they can cycle over in less than five minutes. Oh, that's great. I stretch up on tiptoes to try to grab the biscuits I marooned at the top of the cupboard so that I wouldn't be able to reach them. Sorry, the same side? Yep, on the same side of the village. Carl reaches up past me to get the biscuits. You know their house is a little way outside the village? No, I didn't. <sighs> well, it is. His tone is slightly impatient, as if he'd drawn me a detailed map indicating their exact location. So you could even walk to their place from the house, our house. God, yeah. Easily, it's barely half a mile, I should think. It really couldn't be better. I know I should say something, but at the moment the phrase at the tip of my tongue is, Oh my God, what the hell have I done? But I don't think that's what Carl needs to hear. I aim for a nondescript, mm, noise, but it comes out as a panic squeak. Carl picks up his coffee and looks at me. You are still okay with this, darling? Hmm, I say more enthusiastically, but into the depths of my coffee. Of course I am. You did say you thought it would be brilliant for us to be near Saskia and Max. But, well, if you've changed your mind, then, of course, we could... He sinks into a kitchen chair, suddenly deflated, without looking at me. He looks absolutely crushed. I have to learn to make a decision and stick to it. Even I feel frustrated with myself. The woman who takes half an hour to choose from a menu. The woman who can't even order a drink in a bar without dithering. The woman whose bedroom walls still haven't been repainted because I can't decide which colour I won't start to hate after two days. I first met Carl a little over six months ago when he came into my shop. I rent a very small place in an arcade of antique shops in Islington. 
Of course, now that we're moving, I'll have to close it down and start all over again. It took me forever to find that place. I'm going to put a daily notification on my phone to remind me. It was all your idea. Anyway, one morning I turned up. I was a few minutes late and I was standing outside, peering through the window, thinking about what to swap round to make the display more enticing, when a voice beside me says, It's never open, you know, so I hope you haven't set your heart on anything. I turned to see this tall, handsome man with thick, dark hair, eating a muffin out of a paper bag. He's wearing a beautifully cut suit and is carrying an expensive briefcase, though the immaculate effect is slightly spoiled, or to my mind improved by the light dusting of icing sugar on his upper lip. It's open every day, I reply rather more forcefully than I meant to. Except Mondays, I add, pointing to the sign. I wouldn't trust that if I were you. He puts his briefcase down and leans against the window. For some reason that makes me smile. Seems incongruous somehow. The kind of thing a teenager might do. He smiles back and it takes me unawares. I'm not prepared for a full-on smile at ten o'clock in the morning. Okay, ten past ten. When I'm flustered and late and struggling with too many bags and a sticky Danish and a takeaway cappuccino the size of a small bucket, I fear I'm actually blushing. I've been here since 5-2 and yesterday I came at lunchtime, he continues. There was a sign saying back in five mins. I waited ten, then gave up. This is my last shot at it. He nods at my coffee in Danish. I see you've wisely brought some sustenance to prepare for the epic wait. You must be an old hand. Maybe it's run at a loss as a tax dodge, I say, addressing his reflection in the glass, which somehow seems easier than looking directly at him. That must be it, he smiles. So, he nods at the window, what's caught your eye? If it's that chrome clock there, you'll have to fight me for it. He points to a small 1930s travel clock, which neatly folds up into its case. I think I've earned it by now. He rests his forehead against the glass for a moment, and puts on a silly face of immense yearning, which makes me laugh. I find myself looking, really looking at his face. He's not the kind of man I normally find attractive, to be honest. He's very clean-shaven, well-groomed and formally dressed. Definitely not my type. I've never gone for men in suits. I've always thought there was something sad and repressed about them, as if there's a real person trapped in there who's never allowed out. Good choice, I say. It's a really nice little piece. I rummage in my bag for my keys and avoid looking at him. I swing open the door and flick on the lights. Ah. He looks embarrassed, even though, of course, I'm the one who's late. I'm really very sorry to have kept you waiting. I pick up the clock and hand it to him. I'm not usually late. Except for every time I've come here. Mm, except for those times. Seems a little ironic, don't you think? His gaze travels round the shop. I sell a range of small antiques now, but still there are over thirty clocks on display, including several handsome grandfather clocks, Mantle clocks, plus a large case of restored watches. Originally, I sold nothing but clocks, but then my whimsical desire to eat every week prompted me to diversify a bit. Astonishingly, you wouldn't be the first person to point that out. He's looking at me directly now, as I move away and start rearranging things, slightly altering the position of a green 1940s teapot and shifting a pair of candlesticks along a shelf. If you still want the clock, I'm happy to give you a discount, I say over my shoulder, as compensation for keeping you waiting. Ten percent? He glances at the price ticket. Twenty percent? All right. Don't suppose you could wrap it for me as well, could you? I take it from him and explain how and when to wind it. Is it a birthday present? I rummage under the tissue for the tape. Or... If it's for a wedding, you'll probably won't fancy a paper, won't you? I wrap things in old-fashioned dark green paper and tie them with plain gold cord. Uh-uh. He shakes his head, looks down at the floor for a moment. 
Actually, it's kind of a belated divorce present. Wow, that's generous of you. Shouldn't they be giving you your original wedding gift back, not be receiving another present? I hope it's not for them to share or it'll lead to fights and another fifteen lawyers' letters. This one little clock could end up costing them another couple of grand. He laughs, but it feels as if he's only doing it to be polite. True, very true. No, it's just for the wife. I tug the cord tight and tie it in a double bow. My wife, he adds, clearing his throat. Well, ex-wife, uh, obviously. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. God, why don't I ever know when to shut up? I can feel a blush spreading over my entire body. I place the package between us on the desk. I didn't mean to be facetious about lawyers and, and fights and, and all that. Well, what I meant was, I... Well, um, anyway, probably better if I stop babbling now. Yes, good idea. I attempt to laugh it off. Babble, babble, that's me. Shut up, Natalie. It's fine. He's looking at me with an expression of slight concern, as if he's worried that I might be unwell. Then he waves his hand airily and takes out his wallet. It's yesterday's news. She's actually already remarried. It's all very civilised now. It must be if you're still buying her presents. Ah. He smiles again and hands over his credit card. The clock's actually a sort of joke. I raise my eyebrows. I wouldn't mind knowing someone who'd buy me an exquisite Art Deco clock for a joke. I put his card in the machine. Because she was late all the time, he explains. I'm extremely punctual myself, but for some reason... He pauses and takes a package from the desk, looking into my eyes. I always seem to go for women who are lousy timekeepers. Oh, okay. Now I'm really blushing. I'm sure I must be practically crimson. And now the car machine isn't working. Again, I apologise, explaining that it has a mind of its own in days when it likes to be stroppy. Don't we all, he says, opening his wallet again. I have cash. Thank you. Uh, I'll just get your change, I say, which comes out more of a manic squeak than the calm statement I'd intended. I run into the back room and bring the cash box out, so I can set it down on the desk and unlock it. What I actually do is unlock it when it's still nowhere near the desk, and as I'm holding the handle on the lid, it opens and simply tips all the money straight onto the floor. He calmly crouches down and starts marshalling it into a heap. I can do it, it's fine. I can't deal with this. Men flirting and smiling and looking at me like they can see right into my head. I'm sure you have to go to a meeting or something. I can manage. I'm picking up fistfuls of coins and notes and dropping them again all over the place. Notes are fluttering to the floor like feathers. Coins are rolling under the big grandfather clocks. Hey, it's okay, he says. I'm not trying to steal it. He pushes the pile of money towards me. Here. I was only trying to help. I stuff the cash into the box and hand him his change without looking at him. I didn't think you were trying to steal it. His shoes alone look like they cost more than I make in a week. I don't think he needs the paltry contents of my cash box. Well, uh, you seemed a little... He shrugs. Hysterical. I pull myself up to my full height and attempt to look authoritative and regal. Not easy when you're five foot two. I was not hysterical. I was only very slightly flustered. I attempt to look him straight in the eye, which seems like a good idea, but is actually a lousy one because he simply looks straight back at me. And as he's tall and confident and clearly used to being in charge, and I'm short and hopeless and clearly used to being in a muddle, I get even more flustered and turn away briskly in an attempt to signal that that's now the end of the matter. Which would probably work rather well if only I didn't fall straight over a footstool, banging my head on a dressing table. I grab at the nearest object to try to save myself, but as it's only an old Bakelite telephone, it comes with me, so I crash to the floor, clutching it. I'm lying on the floor of my shop, with a sore head, a painful ankle, and holding a heavy telephone. Oh my God, 
says the man. Are you all right? I think so. I slowly sit up and rub my head, then my ankle. I try to stand up, but my ankle protests, and I promptly collapse back to the floor. Don't move. Stay there. He looks round the shop and sees the chaise long. Then he bends down and starts to lift me. No, no, you can't possibly. I'm fine. I can walk, but please don't. I'm flailing my legs and wishing I hadn't eaten two cream meringues yesterday. I was only going to have one, honestly, but they come in a box of two, so what are you supposed to do with the second one? Crumble it up for the birds? Don't be silly. He picks me up and carries me easily over to the chaise as if I'm no more than a bundle of twigs. Now, he says, crouching down beside me, is there anyone I can call for you? We both look down at the Bakelite phone still sitting on my lap. Its old, frayed, disconnected wire snakes over my knees. Then our eyes meet and suddenly we both start to laugh. But there's a new me now. I can be as decisive as the next person. Well, not if the next person's Carl, obviously, but as decisive as the person next to it. Or maybe the one after that. Not at all, I say firmly. Of course I haven't changed my mind. I stand behind him and squeeze his shoulders and he rests his head back against me. Good. He looks up at me and smiles. I'm sure you will adore the house, lovely wife. All I want is to make you happy. I kiss the top of his head. I am happy. And I really can't wait to move. Chapter 4 A Very Bad Dream The village looks promising as I drive through, and I sink further back into my seat. I hadn't realised quite how tightly I'd been hunching my shoulders. It's bigger than I thought. A small town almost, rather than a village, with plenty of old-fashioned shops along the main street. I catch sight of a bakery, a butcher, a greengrocer, an ironmonger and a wool shop. Exactly the kind of place I love. There's a pretty old stone and flint church at one end of the high street, and a picturesque green set back from the other end, surrounded by tiny beamed white cottages, like something on a postcard. The doorways look so low, I imagine that even I would have to duck to enter. Carl came down yesterday straight after work, so that he could take Saskia and Max out for supper, then he stayed over at a local pub. I drove down earlier this morning to go to an auction in Sandwich and picked up a couple of nice pieces, a rather well-made Victorian side table and an inlaid tea caddy that I know will sell. There was also a really handsome long case clock, but I was outbid. At auctions you have to be very disciplined. Decide on your limit, then stop. You must know when to say enough. I was thinking the table might fit well into the cottage, but I can always sell it in the shop if Carl doesn't like it. I left plenty of time to get here because, for once, I'm determined to be not just on time but slightly early. Carl is meeting me at the cottage after he's picked up the keys, but I can peer through the windows and look round the garden if I'm there first. When he turns up, I will be wafting around, looking quite at home. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a simple picnic all ready for him? Maybe some crusty bread and cheese and apples. There's plenty of time. I pull into a space near the greengrocers and look around for a pay-and-display machine. I can't see one, so I ask a passer-by how I pay to park. It's free parking, love. Free parking? Wow, I love it here. Never mind the dream house. I may live here in my van, relishing the fact that I can park for nothing. In London, when I have to unload something heavy from my van to my shop, I have to pull in on a yellow line round the back put a begging note in the windscreen for the warden. Please, please, I need five minutes to unload. I feel as if I've magically wandered into the pages of a child storybook. An elderly man actually tips his hat to me as he walks by. A woman goes past with an old-fashioned basket over her arm. A small girl is literally skipping along next to her mother. Everyone looks so content. Where I grew up. Walking down the street required you to be constantly on high alert for weirdos, junkies, dog turds and sticking up paving slabs. 
You'd have to steer a course around the perpetually angry woman who'd shout at you if she caught you looking at her. I know you're with the police. And the old alcoholics mooching around the pub, waiting for its doors to open. A lot of people there look grey and exhausted, and only barely clinging on to life, but here. People look like their biggest concern is whether to choose sultana scones or lemon cake for tea. Inside the greengrocers, the air is cool, and I breathe in the scent of fresh earth and sweet fruits, so different from a soulless supermarket. I can smell the apples. Some gorgeous-looking deep red tomatoes are marked by a handwritten sign, grown locally. I'll get some for a picnic with Carl and have a big bowl of fruit on the kitchen table. Or on the floor, where we will one day have a table. Good afternoon, madam. What can I get for you today? She called me madam, like being in an old black and white movie. I too should have a wicker basket over my arm. I smile and open my mouth to speak, but at that moment, a tall blonde woman dashes into the shop and starts talking straight away. Afternoon, Maisie. I'm in a mad rush. I'm absolutely frantic today, I can't tell you. Bung me a couple of lemons, would you? She doesn't look frantic. In fact, she looks cool and extremely well-groomed. Over her arm is a perfect, rustic basket. She looks as if she stepped straight out of the pages of country life. The assistant hesitates awkwardly, looking at me. It's fine, I say. Go ahead, I'm not in a rush. Oh, were you ahead of me? The customer says, though how she could have thought otherwise, I don't know, as I'm clearly the only other person in the shop, aside from the assistant. How sweet of you. I'm running late. She rolls her eyes. As usual. That's okay. Now, she says. Let's see, I'd better have some grapes while I'm here. Yes, the red one's there. Hmm. She pokes about in the box and extracts with finger and thumb a large, perfect bunch. These. And some mushrooms. A couple of peppers. And that's it. Literally nothing else. Ooh, asparagus. So early. Okay, two bunches of that. Is the watercress fresh? She carries on and on, ordering a bit of half the produce in the shop. There's way too much for the basket, so the rest is packed into a box. You wouldn't be a sweetie and pop it out to the car for me. For a moment, I think she means me, and I take half a step towards the box. The assistant doesn't notice and gets there first, fortunately. The customer spots it, however, and can't resist a smirk at my mistake. As a woman turns to go, she says, Thank you so much. That really was so darling of you. I'm in an awful hurry. Another mad day. She bestows a huge smile on me, and I feel somehow as if I've been given a present, even though she pushed in front of me. I buy a few things and put them carefully into my canvas tote bag, wishing I had a proper basket, dreaming that I too have a busy schedule and long honey blonde hair and luscious waves, rather than a mass of dark frizz that looks as if it's been statically charged. From the greengrocers, I pop into the bakery for some crusty rolls, then the deli for cheese. Next to the deli is a fabric shop and upholsterer. Outside, I spot the woman from the greengrocers. She's talking to another woman on the street and gesturing at something in the shop window. I must say she doesn't really look like a person in a mad hurry. She looks like a woman with no worries and all the time in the world, chatting and laughing and ooing and ahhing over the swags of fabric on display. On the way, I spot a shop with traditional handmade baskets hanging up outside. I go in and stand there for a minute. The whole shop is packed floor to ceiling with baskets. Huge ones for logs and small ones for bread and plenty with handles so I could stroll along the high street chatting to the villagers as I do a little light shopping, carefully choosing the best grapes, musing over the perfect curtain fabric for our dream house. I'll get a handmade basket and put our little picnic in it, so it will be absolutely perfect, and Carl will arrive and see me looking quite at home in the countryside, all wifely and wonderful. As I get back into my van, I have a funny feeling in the pit of my stomach, the way I used to before taking an exam, a half-excited, half-terrified feeling. I try to ignore it, and concentrate instead on not getting lost. 
Carl told me that the house actually used to be a small farmhouse, which is why it has a barn, but then most of the land was sold off, leaving only the track, the garden and one field. I've set up my phone to issue audio directions, but Carl gave me a couple of extra pointers as he knows I have this slight tendency to lose my way, and he says it's incredibly easy to miss the turn for the cottage even with sat-nav, especially as the track down to it is private, so it's not on Google Maps. Emerging from the village now, I see the houses are more widely spaced. And then suddenly, I'm in proper countryside, with open fields on either side of the road, flanked by hedges and punctuated by large trees. I spot oak and ash and maybe hawthorn. This is amazing. I can't believe I finally get to live out in the country, like I've always wanted. I keep going straight along for a bit, but then automatically slow down. Now that's a serious house. It's gorgeous. A beautiful Georgian brick house, almost a small manor, with elegant sash windows, a wide gravel driveway and stylish clipped box bushes either side of a stone path to the front door. I try to avert my eyes, telling myself not to look at it. It'll only make me disappointed when I get to our house, as it can't possibly be as spectacular as that. I carry on over a sweet little humpback bridge, round a very sharp bend, then suddenly spot the pointy tree that Carl told me to look out for. I turn left, then check Carl's directions again, though I have already read them at least twenty-five times. Proceed until road forks, then take the right-hand fork downwards. Open gate. You'll need to untie it as well as unhook it, then close it behind you. Road becomes a track and looks as if it leads nowhere but keep going. At the bottom, follow track round to your left to park. And you're home. In fact, the gate's already wide open. So maybe this isn't the right track after all. I reread the directions. No, it must be the one. Ah, Carla's got here first, that's it. Yes. I can make out faded, painted lettering on the top bar of the gate. Rose Cottage. This is it. I follow the unmade bumpy track down and down, under a canopy of trees arching overhead. There's the barn set back from the track. Gosh, it's beautiful, with rough-hewn stone at the base and dark wood planking above. I know I'm going to love this place. Carl warned me that there are a couple of issues outside that need attending to, so I'm not to panic. Some missing roof tiles, an ugly separate garage that is almost falling down, and the garden's a bit overgrown. Honestly, does he really think I can't see past a few weeds and minor problems? I'm good at visualising. I'm hardly going to be put off by a patch of nettles and a missing tile or two. You have to look at the proportions, that's the important thing. They're like the bones of a house, and if they're good, then that's all that matters. You can always improve everything else, can't you? As long as the setting's nice. Well, it certainly is secluded. You could drive past the top of the lane a thousand times and never realise that there was anything down here. I swing the van round to park and come to a halt. You have to envisage the whole thing in all its glory once you put your own stamp on it. Not get bogged down in petty little details, like a bit of peeling paintwork or dated wallpaper or... Or the fact that it has no roof. Oh dear God. I can't yet see the house properly because it's surrounded by towering thistles, triffids and other aggressive plant life taller than I am. But I can see the roof, or the non-roof to be exact. I pick my way along what must once have been a path clutching my new willow basket in front of me as a shield against various prickly, stinging, flailing weeds. I can't believe it. I know Carl likes to put a positive spin on things, that's his job after all. But how could he call this a few missing roof tiles? From the front, well over half of the tiles are gone, so that all you can see are the timbers and joists and, I suppose, the roofing felt. I go round the back. This side's not so bad. Just a few slip tiles halfway down, but otherwise intact. My mobile rings. It's Carl. Hi, darling. Sorry, I'm running late. They've mislaid the keys. 
Where are you? Are you in the village? No, I'm at the house. At, at least I, I think it's the house. Did you turn left at the pointy tree? He says in a teasing tone. Yes. Did you manage the gate all right? It's very heavy. It was open. Really? That's odd. Still, isn't it amazing? What do you think? Don't you absolutely love it? I haven't really had a chance to see it properly. I've just arrived this second. I'm trying desperately hard not to sound so stricken. Um, I hadn't realised about the roof, darling. It's fine. I spoke to a local builder yesterday. He says he's sure he can sort it out in no time. Oh, OK. You might have told me, though, Carl. I did get a bit of a shock. Oh, you funny little thing. Honestly, a few tiles. The place has been a bit neglected for some years. I did warn you. Hardly a few. Look, I'll be there in a couple of minutes. Have a stroll around, hmm? Go and chat to the ducks. I'm not really in the mood to chat to the ducks, but still I take a wander down beyond the house, around a stand of trees towards the pond. Now this really is incredible. No wonder Carl thought I would love it here. It's so much bigger than an ordinary garden pond, and it looks natural. I crouch down at the edge. The water's surprisingly clear. The edge is fringed here and there with rushes and yellow irises. There are coots and ducks dabbling in the water. Oh, that one has little ducklings swimming after her. This is idyllic. When I was a child, we lived in a rented flat in a grotty area. There was one sad communal play area of berry-worn grass and a swing set with only one swing seat remaining, the other three just empty pairs of chains hanging there. But at the weekends, sometimes our mum drove us out to the countryside. Only for the day, because we couldn't afford to stay anywhere overnight, but we'd pack up sandwiches and a flask of tea. One time we found a pond, and I remember lying on my tummy, gazing at the water, wishing I could stay like that forever, watching all the insects zipping about, and the ducks and coots paddling to and fro. It felt like a magical, secret place, where everything was beautiful a completely different world from where we actually lived. A place where all I could hear was the drowsy buzzing of bees and the whispery rustlings of the reeds, rather than our neighbours slamming doors and shouting, or drivers leaning on their horns when they'd come to pick someone up, as it was easier than having to climb the stairs because the lift was broken yet again. <laughs> After I've explored all around the garden, I head back to the house, and am perching on the front step, when I hear a large, angry creature crashing through the undergrowth, heading in my direction. It's Carl, and he looks more furious than I've ever seen him. Where's the fucking roof? What do you mean? I mean, where's the fucking roof gone? He looks round wildly, as if it might be nestling beneath a patch of tall thistles. Somehow, I feel I'm the target of his accusation that he's expecting me to suddenly produce it from behind my back. Then it wasn't like this before. No, of course not. Why would I buy a house with no roof and not mention it? You said it had a few missing tiles. I, I thought you were just, you know, being... What? He barks at me. Being what? Suddenly I feel on the verge of tears. This was supposed to be our dream house but I've been here less than ten minutes and already we've got no roof and my husband's shouting at me. Being positive? I say quietly. I stand up straight and look him in the eye. I thought you were doing a consummate PR job, putting a positive spin on it. Why on earth would I do that? He says, barely glancing at me and raising his eyes to the roof once more. Jesus, look at it. Because it's what you do. For a living, yes. He strides off around the side of the house. I start to follow him, then stop. I have a sudden vision of spending my whole life hanging on to my husband's coattails, whimpering in his wake like a puppy, scampering to keep up so he'll pat me on the head and take notice of me. I stand well back from the house so I can see the roof more clearly. It sweeps right down, almost to my own height. I think it's called a cat slide roof. 
the remaining tiles look original, handmade, made with subtle shifts in colour and tone. Must have looked amazing. Um, before. After a minute, Carl reappears. He seems surprised to see me still standing there. Where were you? He says, as if I've been hiding in the undergrowth. Right here? I thought you were going to follow me. What did you mean, it's what I do?